So that was a real uh, honor to be introduced by Harold. And uh, I'll take a few minutes to tell you a story. Um, recently, I built a man cave in the basement. And I've been saving newspapers my entire life from important events in my life. And now I had the man cave. The newspapers are going to go up as posters. And of course, it's you know Red Sox win the World Series, uh, the shuttle launch, things like this. But there was one from my uh, four years in San Francisco, which the headline is, Giants win pennant. So of course, that's why I saved that newspaper. But then in the lower right corner, I noticed Varmus and Bishop win Nobel Prize. <laughs> of course. Uh, Quote the visionary that I was. I didn't know Harold, didn't know Mike, and didn't know how important the discoveries they made at that time would be for us and uh, for my own career. Uh, really, that observation that cellular oncogenes were the thing that drove cancer, not tumor viruses per se, which was really sort of the, the thing we were all that was being thought of at the time. That plus the discovery of tumor suppressors, I think, set the trajectory that we've been on for. Uh, the last uh, 20 years or so with the objective of understanding the combination of oncogenes and tumor suppressors that contribute to cancer and then making therapeutic advances uh, based on that. So uh, Harold, you'll be happy to know that will be in the man cave since uh, you were lucky enough that you won the Nobel Prize the day the Giants won the pennant. <laughs> so um, the other interesting observation that happened uh, during uh, the last 20 years or so was the paradigm shift that was exemplified by the <clears throat> results of imatinib in the disease chronic biologic leukemia, and I, I think this is well known, but still worth uh, reflecting on. Uh, of course, CML is interesting in that it was really the first time a somatic genetic lesion was discovered in 1960 by Nolan Hungerford. It, it only took us about 50 years to figure out what DNA was, what a kinase was, what phosphorylation was, that you could make small molecules. Uh, but 50 years later, uh, you have a drug, imatinib, that's um, uh, very effective at inhibiting the output of this oncogene. And this is the um, efficacy data in the United States, not based on a clinical trial, but rather based on looking at the statistics of mortality and incidents per year in the United States, just uh, going to the Cancer Journal of Statistics and pulling out their estimates every year. So beginning uh, in 1997, the incidence of CML, the number of new cases per year in the United States was around 4,500, and you can see that that's remained constant uh, over the next uh, 14 to 15 years. Imatinib was introduced into the market in uh, 2001, and thereafter mortality dropped from an annual mortality rate of 2,500 deaths per year down to around 440. Uh, nilotinib and dasatinib, second generation uh, ABLE inhibitors, were introduced in 2010. Interestingly, the mortality rate in 2011 dropped a little bit. You can sort of speculate, uh, based on no data, that that may be related to second generation inhibitors coming into the market. So there are a few things worth noting. First, um, when this really was uh, going, people may forget that there were a bunch of uh, naysayers that thought this was not going to really work. That is, yes, it was working transiently, but ultimately the dreaded CML stem cell would take off and patients would die because the stem cell population would progress. Cancers were smart. They would find genetic ways around this. Um, uh, and in fact, if you look at not the incidence, but the prevalence of the disease. This is the number of patients now alive with CML. In 2007, it was around 25,000 patients. By 2010, it was around 37,000 patients. This just illustrates that the mortality per prevalent case is continuing to decline. So there has not been sort of the inexorable uh, progression in this uh, case. Now, that being said, there was still a big question as to whether or not this would or would not translate from a relatively simple genetic disease and one that's hematologic uh, in nature um, and maybe even represents the benign precursor to advanced leukemia. Would this really be relevant to the more complex uh, solid tumors that we see at a later stage? And Matthew and I, along with uh, Tom Lynch and, his, and uh, Dan Haber and Harold and William Powell were fortunate to participate in this discovery of EGFR mutations in lung cancer, which you know, illustrated that, yes, you could have fairly dramatic therapeutic results with inhibitors of specifically activated mutant oncogenes, even in solid tumors. 
So I'm, I'm not going to go through the other many examples um, of where this paradigm has translated, just to say that I think this is a translatable paradigm more broadly than just in CML. So now we can sort of look back and think of two different modes of drug development, an era, which we still are living in, of empiric drug discovery, where therapeutics were applied without knowledge to the underlying pathogenesis, generally to unselected patient populations looking for small benefit, I'm comparing in A, the intact trial of ERISA in unselected lung cancer patients to the power of a single patient observation, one patient with a mutation being treated having a dramatic response. So these two modes of uh, drug development coexist today. Uh, I think we all hope to have more of B than of A, and the question and a conversation for the rest of the talk is how do we make B better? Um, and that, of course, involves sort of identifying the major limitations to making the drug discovery mechanism uh, applicable to the genetics of cancer, more robust, more reliable. So I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking about five key issues for this paradigm. The first is if you want to take on the genetic basis of cancer, and this is your job, uh, you have to know the genetic basis of cancer. And for many years, we have not known the genetic basis of cancer. So we need to know this to completion, in my view. And I resonate with Lou's comment that the genetic experiment has been done. It's been done in humans over and over and over again. We just haven't gotten the results yet. So what does it mean to do this to completion? And I know there are people who think we know all the single gene mutations. So what? Uh, we need to know this. We need to finish the atlas. We have a long way to go. We need to know this in all cancer types and all cancer subtypes. That's in and of itself a big challenge. We need to know it along the stage of cancer. In prostate cancer, what's the biggest question today? Yes, metastatic, but also the, the over-treatment of pre-malignant or benign early stage prostate cancer. What do we know about the genetic differences between that disease and the type of disease that kills patients? Not, not very much. So we need to know it across the evolution of cancer. And then we need to know it with a robust sample size and robust, robust death, depth of analysis that the genetics we, we understand at the level of functional redundancy, we can understand cooperation, and we can understand antagonistic genetic events. That is, two things are mutually exclusive either because they're redundant or because they're antagonistic. We're nowhere near the sample sizes yet to make those claims. Matthew showed a few examples, but I'm guessing those are still on the verge of statistical significance. And that's when you're only trying to do any two genetic lesions. The second you want to know three genetic lesions or four, we're still very underpowered with respect to um, the, the ability to do this. And I believe firmly when we have that power, these Genetics are going to fall into well-defined pathways. Common nodes of therapeutic intervention could be identified simply by looking at uh, the genetic map. So I think that's the aspiration and the hope. This is your task, I think, and I'm not going to spend any more time talking about it today. So that's the problem number one, and I'm counting on you guys to solve that. Problem number two is, is where we have to start thinking uh, more deeply, which is, even when we've known the genetic alterations in cancer, some of the absolute best genetic alterations in cancer, we have not made sufficient progress in turning that information into robust drug candidates. And that problem comes in two flavors. The oncogenes, um, so how many of the oncogenes are actually druggable today? Uh, not very many, and it includes uh, oncogenes like RAS, which are mutant in 90% of pancreas cancer, ERG ETV1, which uh, looks like it's translocated in between 80 to 90 percent of prostate cancer, BCL2, which is a, a, a dominant oncogene in lymphoma. These types of oncogenes outside the kinases have really been refractory to drug discovery. Now, I think they've been refractory for two reasons. One is they're, they are, in fact, harder, but two is people may not be trying hard enough, and I think that's where um, industry also needs to play a more active role. I think a, a great example of an attack on this problem was the work of Steve Fessick and his colleagues at Abbott Pharmaceuticals, who took 10 years, and as I, know, I think they're still working on this problem, 
to try to make inhibitors of the interaction between BH3 peptides and the BCL2 uh, family members. And this is difficult because it's a very large surface, a very large protein-protein interaction, doesn't have the same tight, uh, well-recognized binding uh, structures that kinases do. Nonetheless, they were able over time to elaborate ABT263, which was a lead clinical candidate, and now they have a second molecule uh, going into the clinic attacking this class of oncogenes. So this is an example of taking on the question of, uh, quote, undruggable, challenging the notion that something's undruggable and uh, making headway um, despite the skepticism that one could make a drug against this family. The second class of genetics that we talked about earlier is the tumor suppressor pathways. And of course, this is even more difficult because in, instead of having an activated gene which you could inhibit, you simply have the absence of a gene. Uh, now, I think this is where uh, the concept of synthet synthetic lethality is going to play a big role. And I just wanted to show you a few examples that may not be so obvious to people that suggest this is really working. So the first is the example of the hedgehog pathway. So we know that mutations in the patched tumor suppressor gene occur in basal cell carcinoma and medulloblastoma. Um, and Phil Beachy's lab discovered the natural product cyclopamine as a natural product antagonist of the receptor smoothened. Now based on the way this pathway works, it was predicted that patched deficiency would lead to constitutive activation of the smoothened receptor, and the work from the Beachy lab suggested that antagonists of the smoothened receptor would reverse the phenotypic consequences of patch deficiency. Now, this seems like an obvious one, but synthetic lethality doesn't say it has to be in a parallel pathway or some magically unknown mechanism. This is or can be an example of synthetic lethality as well. So I just wanted to show you the example um, that we've been working on, LDE-225, which is a smoothened inhibitor. It has an IC50 for human smoothened in in vitro assays of 11 nanomolar and in cellular assays of 7 nanomolar. So it's a very potent, non-natural product synthetic inhibitor of smoothened. We were very interested in the, in the idea of targeting medulloblastoma, and there was a lot of divergent opinions as to whether you do or don't need blood-brain barrier penetrating molecules to treat a CNS or cerebral lesion like medulloblastoma. Nonetheless, we decided to make a CNS penetrating molecule. Here's an example of a preclinical study where a patch deficient orthograph from a mouse was transplanted into a skid mouse brain. Uh, and treated with LDE-225 versus vehicle, and you can see the, the two untreated tumors grow very rapidly, while the, the LDE-treated uh, tumors regress over time. So we had fairly strong evidence that in a patch-deficient model, in the right location, uh, we were able to affect a therapeutic response in a preclinical model. So medulloblastoma is interesting. You would think we would just sequence the patch gene and then take those patients and put them on the drug. It turns out, um, this is sort of three to four years ago, sequencing patched from paraffin embedded samples wasn't the easiest thing in the world uh, because of the number of exons you have to sequence. Paraffin embedded sequencing has made a lot of progress since then. Um, but in the end, we basically made a gene expression signature to capture hedgehog activity as had been defined by some of the key investigators in this field uh, by the transcriptional signature of the pathway rather than by the genetics. So uh, we developed an expression signature using 40 medulloblastomas that were uh, embedded in fresh uh, in, in uh, paraffin embedded tissue. A multi-gene model was built using the elastic neck model. The optimal model selection was uh, validated using uh, an independent data set. And these five genes were selected for evaluation in the clinic using uh, a QRT-PCR assay. So four genes that are up in the hedgehog pathway and one gene that's down. So this is, drug has been through phase one in, in uh, both basal cell and medulloblastoma and is now in uh, phase uh, two studies. This is an example of a pediatric patient who had a complete response to the drug. You can see at baseline had a tumor near the brain stem and the cere cerebellum, uh, and then by cycle five had no evidence of disease. 
the results so far using um, unselected medulloblastoma patients and then retrospectively characterizing them for the signature is that all five patients who have a signature positive medulloblastoma have responded to the drug where none out of the patients uh, who are signature negative have responded. And this number on the right is now zero out of 21 uh, signature negative patients. So in many ways, this is an interesting control group. We have uh, you know, a mechanism-based signature, a mechanism-based inhibitor, and activity that seems to be strongly linked to uh, the pathway signature. So this is an example, as I said, of this idea of synthetic lethality where a mutation in the cancer uh, predisposes, uh, it, it enhances viability of the cancer. Of course, the drug target, the drug itself has to be uh, viable for the host, but where the cell that bears the mutation plus the drug has a lethal phenotype, in this case it would be the patch deficient medulloblastoma cell being lethal when exposed to LDE-225. So I'll just give you one more example of um, what I consider a synthetic lethal uh, interaction and a successful attack on a tumor suppressor pathway, and that involves the PI3 kinase pathway and, and in particular, the tuber sclerosis gene. So tuber sclerosis is a, is a fairly rare hereditary uh, syndrome uh, that's associated with a number of manifestations, but on the cancer side, it's associated with two interesting tumors angiomyolipomas of the kidney and subependymal giant cell astrocytoma, uh, a, a tumor in the CNS. Now work in Drosophila had shown that or suggested that in the absence of TSC, mTOR kinase and S6 kinase would be constitutively dysregulated. And in fact, the first experiments of rapamycin analogs in a TSC deficient setting were done in Drosophila, and you could essentially reverse the, at least the larval phenotype in Drosophila by treatment with uh, rapamycin. So this suggested that rapamycin or rapamycin analogs like Everolimus would be particularly effective in TSC deficient settings. So this has been tested in um, children and adults with tuberous sclerosis, first in the subependymal giant cell astrocytoma setting, but also in the angiomyolipomas. This is an example of a patient with a fairly large subependymal uh, tumor, which has not had a complete response, but has had a, a fairly significant response. We've conducted a phase three trial led by uh, David Franz and John Bisler at the University of uh, Cincinnati. And the results of the phase three trial uh, are shown here. In the first year of the trial, no patient with SEGA progressed on, on uh, therapy. Uh, at the time, this was a controlled trial against placebo because there's no approved therapy for, for SEGA. The overall partial response rate was 35% versus zero in the placebo. And in the kidney tumors, the response rate is 53% versus 0%. And based on this data, the FDA approved uh, Finitor or Everolimus in, in this disease uh, late last year. So again, to me, this uh, exemplifies the notion of synthetic lethality that a tumor suppressor gene a lesion like TSC predisposes preferentially to sensitivity to a, 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 um, a TOR inhibitor compared to the normal cells bearing intact copies of TSC, which are, let's say, uh, relatively insensitive or at least give you a therapeutic index when uh, a patient is treated with a rapamycin analog. So Everolimus was also treated, uh, was also um, uh, studied in breast cancer and had fairly significant uh, advanced advances in progression-free survival in the ER positive setting of breast cancer. Now this goes back to model A, because honestly at the beginning of this trial I don't think anybody had any idea of why a rapamycin analog would work in ER positive breast cancer. I'm not sure we still understand why it would or wouldn't work, but what's intriguing from the work that's going on in the, the TCGA project, and I have to admit this was a very difficult figure for me to deconvolute, but I've, I've tried to simplify it to these two things, which are in the ER positive subgroup of breast cancer, there's a fairly high rate of PI3 kinase mutation, and one can hope or speculate that perhaps the effect of TOR inhibitors in ER positive breast cancer is greatest in the PI3 kinase mutant population. Uh, I have no data for that, but fortunately we do in fact have the samples 
from this trial, and those samples are being uh, analyzed now uh, in a collaboration with Foundation Medicine, looking at about 500 genes for mutations to see whether or not there are or are not correlates with clinical benefit to uh, TOR inhibitors in this, uh, in this trial. I'll say one thing about this, because some people would think, well, now that you have an approved drug, why would you go back and even bother to find out? I, I think that's a really good question that is a challenge for the industry. I happen to think there's some really good reasons. One is, if you know you have a mutation, you know the patient is more likely to benefit, you're more likely to optimize the drug for that patient. The second is, you're more likely to work through toxicity find a dose that the patient can tolerate, find a treatment regimen the patient can tolerate, rather than just simply give up because you didn't really understand why the patient would benefit in the first place. And then from an economic point of view, let's face it, if those are all the patients that are benefiting, that's where all the money is being made anyway. Uh, so I'm quite hopeful that uh, this is going to make sense, uh, not just scientifically, but also from a clinical and maybe even economic point of view. So I want to give you one more tumor suppressor example because I think it's also motivated by the work of the TCGA, which is the, uh, the common mutation in the PI3 kinase pathways that are found in uh, malignant glioma. Uh, the dominant mutation in the PI3 kinase pathway is not TSC1 and 2 in this case, but is rather P10, but also PIK3CA and the regulatory subunit uh, of PIK3CA shown further to the right on this slide are also commonly mutated. And I think this was a highlight of the, the TCGA glioma paper showing this sort of very dominant activation of the PI3 kinase pathway in glioma. So we've been working on, um, uh, on PI3 kinase inhibitors and one of the central questions is which PI3 kinase subunit would be synthetic lethal with P10 deficiency? I wouldn't say this is locked down uh, uh, definitively, but the preponderance of the evidence suggests that in the situation of loss of P10, as shown here, where we've compared depletion of PI3 kinase beta with PI3 kinase alpha, P10 deficient cells, um, as shown right here, tend to be pretty dependent on PI3 kinase uh, beta uh, versus uh, alpha, and this is a, a PIK3CA uh, knockdown in a P10 deficient cell uh, shown here. Now, because PI3 kinase alpha can probably take over, we have not taken the uh, strategy of making a beta selective um, inhibitor. Uh, there are other companies that are doing that. We've uh, taken the strategy of trying to make a pan uh, type 1 PI3 kinase inhibitors. Uh, people ask me, why don't you just make an alpha beta? I would if I could. Um, it's not so easy to make an alpha-beta dual specificity inhibitor because of the structural homology between alpha and delta uh, makes that very difficult. So nonetheless, BCAM120 is a PI3 kinase inhibitor that inhibits uh, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. It has uh, activity against the common alpha mutations. It also has very good blood-brain barrier penetrating properties. In fact, maybe a little too good, it accumulates in the brain over plasma concentrations. So this was also the intent of this program was to have a molecule that would work in glioma because of its uh, BBB penetrating properties. This is exemplified in this study where we implanted um, a PI3, uh, P10 deficient cell line in the brain. In the top panel, we're comparing BKM120 to GDC0941, which is a type 1 PI3 kinase inhibitor that does not have brain penetration. And you can see in blue is the, um, the PK of the molecule. Uh, so you get very good brain exposure after dosing with BKM120. GDC0941 does not have brain penetration. Phospho-AKT suppression is shown in yellow, so concordant with high exposure in the brain, we get rapid and uh, profound diminution in phospho-AKT in the brain. And this is associated with the ability to prevent tumor genicity in uh, orthotopically injected, uh, in this case, breast cancer cells that are uh, PI3 kinase dependent. So we're currently studying BCAM120 in glioma, and I don't have any results to share with you. I, I'm hoping it will be successful, but uh, this is our attempt to, again, exploit a potential synthetic relationship between, synthetic lethal relationship between P10 deficiency and PI3 kinase dependence. 
So more broadly, there have been a lot of attempts to now discover synthetic lethal interactions, and the dominant way people are trying to do this is by shRNA screening. I would say, like genetic sequencing, this has been noisy so far, but it hasn't been done uh, to the extent that we need to do it at a robust level with deep shRNA libraries across large numbers of cell lines. In many cases, people are using isogenic pairs of cell lines, which we find has a lot of uh, noise to it. Uh, our approach has been tr to try to use cell line panels that are genetically defined, find shRNAs that are selectively depleting or killing certain mutant, uh, pan mutant cells. An example of this is shown here where beta-catenin shRNAs are highly enriched for their de in depletion experiments in the APC deficient subset of cell lines. So if you didn't know beta-catenin was a key player in the APC pathway, you would have discovered it as the very top hit in this particular screen. So I have a lot of faith still in these uh, types of experiments. I just think that you know, we're not at the point where they've been great yet, and I, I think they'll get um, better and better over time. So that's problem number two, and sort of the idea of taking on the oncogenes and the tumor suppressors by working on difficult to drug uh, oncogenes, and then trying to exploit systematically this notion of synthetic lethality for discovering druggable genes downstream of either tumor suppressors or, of course, uh, undruggable oncogenes. Now, the third issue which we're going to face and we face already is resistance. So um, it, there's not going to be a single uh, drug that wipes out cancer like uh, EGFR mutant lung cancer. Um, we know we're going to have to have combinations, and the reason for that is resistance develops to targeted agents. Now, this has caused a lot of hand-wringing, too. Right after BCR Able's success with Gleevec, resistance developed. People said, oh, no. Um, but shortly thereafter, um, I'm going to just skip to this. Uh, Charles Sawyers and uh, Neil Shaw discovered that the resistance was likely mediated by mutations in ABLE. Now, this also caused two lines of thought. One was, oh no, the cancers are so smart. Others of us thought, wow, that is pretty exciting. Um, I could have thought of three million other base pairs that might have been mutated that might have caused resistance, but in fact, these cancers chose or had to mutate able in order to survive. To me, this suggested this concept of addiction was very powerful uh, and also led to the notion that the next best thing you could do in CML was to make a better able inhibitor. Now, I would contrast that to the situation with Taxol. I'm still not sure we have any idea of what Taxol resistance is. Why? Because we don't actually know how Taxol works. We don't know why it works in ovarian cancer. We don't know why it works in lung cancer. The advantage in the targeted therapy paradigm is we generally know why the inhibitor is working. We generally can understand the mechanisms of resistance at a much faster rate and use that information to leverage further drug discovery. So in the case of Novartis, this led to the generation of a second molecule known as nilotinib. In the case of BMS, BMS developed desatinib. Both of them are more potent ABLE inhibitors. Nilotinib is a very interesting comparison because structurally it's very similar to imatinib as I, I've shown here. The central difference is that it is 10 times more potent at the cellular level. Gleevec is 220 nanomolar in cellular assays. Nilotinib is 20 nanomolar. For KIT, we know that Gleevec is a KIT inhibitor. For KIT, nilotinib and Gleevec are fairly comparable. So the clinical trial that was done to compare uh, nilotinib and imatinib was a test of whether more potent kinase inhibition matters or not. Uh, and I think you know, that was answered dramatically in the uh, yes, where the more potent kinase inhibitor, nilotinib, doubled the rate of major molecular response and complete molecular response. So that tells us that cells are really addicted to these genes, and we really need to inhibit them uh, very well, it, at least in the case of uh, CML. So in some cases, improved or enhanced target inhibition is going to be a method for overcoming resistance. We still wonder about this with EGFR, whether we really have the final best EGFR inhibitor yet or not. Um, such improved inhibitors will not only work in the resistance setting, but they will most likely become the, the better frontline therapy. So the question is, are there other opportunities? I mentioned EGFR. I wanted to share you one uh, new opportunity that we've been uh, working on where we now have clinical data and that is uh, targeting ALK translocations in lung cancer. 
So I think many of you know that uh, Pfizer's drug crisotinib was approved in very rapidly after the discovery of the ELML4 ALK translocations in lung cancer. Uh, interestingly, crisotinib is a potent ALK inhibitor, but also a potent MET inhibitor. In fact, it's a little better on, uh, on um, uh, it can be a little better on MET than ALK. Uh, we have made a selective ALK inhibitor that uh, is um, 50, 150 picomolar in in vitro assays and uh, 3.2 micromolar on MET, so very selective for ALK, and 27 nanomolar in cellular assays versus uh, crisotinib, which is 110 nanomolar, so about four to five fold more potent in cellular assays than crisotinib. In an EML4 ALK driven uh, xenograft, single, uh, you know, three to six milligram doses are sufficient to regress the tumors completely. And if we look in the cell line encyclopedia, something I'll describe in a second, across 600 cell lines, you can see for LDK, the three most sensitive cells are all ALK-driven uh, cell lines. And the gap between those and other, let's say, non-genetically ALK-driven cells are, uh, is quite large. Um, so we were very encouraged by the profile of this drug. We didn't really know at that time what mechanisms of crisotinib resistance would really be evident. It was we were following pretty quickly on the heels of crisotinib. Uh, but nonetheless, we went into crisotinib refractory patients, uh, and you can see essentially every patient is responding. The response rate at the, this is the data from the MGH and Alice Shaw, is 81% in crisotinib refractory patients, really simply by making a more potent uh, ALK inhibitor. So we're, we're very excited about this data, but again, I think it highlights the notion that really targeting the key oncogenes with potent inhibitors is, uh, is one key mechanism for trying to prevent resistance. Now, that's not the only mechanism of resistance, and I think in the BRAF setting, we're seeing a quite different picture. So in the setting of BRAF, where we have well-defined downstream pathway, almost no BRAF mutations have been found as mediators of resistance to vemurafenib or other BRAF inhibitors. Instead, the work of people like Neil Rosen and Levi Garraway and Richard Murray have identified a host of different ways that melanoma cells seem to be able to evolve uh, resistance to the inhibitors. Now, that could be also really bad news, but in my view, the good news is still pretty good. Why? Because almost every one of those mechanisms reactivates the MEK-ERK pathway. Um, again, you know, I could have imagined mutations in the uh, PI3 kinase pathway or uh, a lot of other pathways, but a dominant message that we're getting from studying resistance in the BRAF mutant setting is that pathway reactivation is critical for the development of resistance. And this has led a number of companies, GSK is sort of out in front on this, uh, to try to develop dual combinations of MEK-RAF inhibitors as a way to create a hurdle over which the cancer cell will not be able to, uh, to get over. So I'm quite optimistic, in fact, that the study of resistance will ultimately lead us either to the best molecules and or to the best uh, combinations. But this does lead to problem number four, which is we know that one drug is never enough. Now, ideally, the sequencing and the genetics of the cancer will tell us what we should be doing. We're, of course, not there yet because we're just starting to understand the single gene mutation frequency. Resistance may be another mechanism by which we get to the right combinations. Uh, we're also interested in trying to explore combination space by large-scale systematic screening. And I'm just going to uh, skip this and show you um, the project that's ongoing. This is a large-scale combination screen that we're doing in collaboration with Zalicus. Uh, they're a company that used to be called Combinatorics, which probably makes uh, why we're collaborating with them more sense. Uh, the screen is 70 compounds by 70 compounds over 100, and it's actually 138 cell lines now, um, using this type of combination grid. Just to give you an idea of how hard this is, that's um, 27 million data points, and it's taking us two years to just do that one experiment. Um, and I still think it's underpowered myself. So some of the things that are emerging are expected. We can see the expected synergies between check inhibitors and gemcitabines, or the antagonism between a microtubule stabilizer and topoisomerase inhibitors. Uh, but it remains to be seen uh, when the data are complete whether we're really going to get informative stratification of combinations by this sort of uh, large-scale screening. So um, just to close, 
Uh, I've mentioned a few of the translational infrastructure uh, model systems we're using, but I think this has been another uh, problem to the advancement of genetic uh, and, and other forms of cancer therapy, that is, lack of a preclinical translational infrastructure. And just to be very simplistic about it, how many papers have you read where the entire paper is about one cell line? Right, okay, that's, that's one patient's cancer. We would never run a clinical trial with one patient's cancer. So we've had this problem that we've had, you know, very limited ability to profile preclinically the same number of samples from cancer of patients we're about to, to treat clinically. So the idea of the cell line encyclopedia was to try to go from one cell line to this encyclopedia of a thousand cell lines. This was a uh, long-term collaboration with the Broad, which is ongoing, where we bought from commercial sources a thousand cancer cell lines. Um, they were bought from commercial sources so that if you want the exact cell line we used, you can order it from the same source. Uh, so we bought them, took them out of the vial, grew them in a, in a limited way and made DNA, RNA as soon after purchase as we could so that the community can hopefully access as close to the same cell line uh, as the data is uh, here. Of course, then we've gone on to do the genetics and expression. Um, when we started this project, there was no next-gen sequencing, so um, we had sort of aspiration of sequencing like 50 genes or something like that, and now it's uh, with the help of TCGA going well beyond that. So, of course, the key now is to figure out a way to profile the encyclopedia, identify sensitive cells, and hope that amongst the sensitive cells, there's a biomarker that is enriched in the sensitive cells as compared to the uh, largely insensitive cells. And the trick to this is um, having a uh, system that allows you to do this. So this is um, a system that was built first at GNF and then um, put in place in, uh, in Novartis. So it's a robotic system with uh, automated cell culture as well as a, um, compound handling. So this is the incubator. Th those are plates in the incubator. Robot is retrieving the cells from the incubator. <clears throat> the cover of the cells comes off and then it goes on to the compound dispensing deck. So these are compounds being pipetted into the 1572 well uh, plate. You can imagine trying to do that manually. And then after the compounds are dis uh, dispensed onto the plate, the plate goes back into the incubator. Three days later, it comes out of the incubator, and then um, by cell titer glow, the number of cells on the plate are, are measured. So with this system, um, we can profile about 3,000 compounds with triplicate IC50 curves in about a two to three month uh, period. In fact, the method of dispensing now has switched from pin dispensing to acoustic dispensing, which uh, turns out to be um, much more uh, rapid. So just to show you one example from the Cell Line Encyclopedia and how this can motivate the uh, clinical development, this is our um, PI3 kinase alpha inhibitor, BYL719. It has a single digit nanomolar activity against PI3 kinase alpha and, and reduced activity against beta, delta, and gamma. So of course this compound has been run against the Cell Line Encyclopedia and the types of profiles you're looking for are not the all green, which are all dead, or the all red, which are all live, but compounds that are of interest are the ones that are gonna have heterogeneous um, sensitivities among the encyclopedia. Uh, with the help of the Broad, um, we've built a informatics platform for sifting through 50,000 features that are um, in combination genetics or expression, lineage, uh, et cetera. Um, using compound response measures such as AMAX or IC50 or AUC, using those to categorize cells into sensitive, refractory, or intermediate, and then throwing out the intermediate and using the sensitive and refractory uh, populations, building models that try to predict um, uh, compound sensitivity, and Nico is here and others that uh, you can ask about exactly how this works because I really don't know. Um, but what's impressive to me is uh, from 50,000 features, the number one predicted feature for PI3 kinase was PI3 kinase mutation. Now everybody's saying, okay, I already knew that. Still, for all of those of you who do a lot of large-scale data analysis, having the right answer, not in the top 20, not in the top 10, at the number one position, I think is still pretty impressive. And you can see from the list, that was true for a number of oncogenic 
uh, proteins and their cognate therapeutics. The power of that data set for us is that when we went to do the clinical trial, the data were compelling enough that the clinical trial from the beginning was done in PI3 kinase mutation, mutant patients. So right away, the phase one was not an all-comers dose escalation. Instead, only patients with PI3 kinase mutation were enrolled onto the phase one, uh, and dose escalation was done in those patients. And uh, I, I can say we know it's well tolerated. We've seen uh, significant signs of tumor shrinkage, uh, as shown here in a patient with PI3 kinase uh, mutated ovarian cancer. So I, I think this has been really transformative for us. Every one of our project teams now is waiting on an annual basis to see their compounds in this uh, encyclopedia and to you know, try to either validate existing therapeutic hypotheses or create uh, new ones. Now, we know that cell lines are deficient uh, for many things. Number one is they grow on a plastic surface, and uh, that can't possibly replicate all of human cancer. We also know that cell lines don't even replicate human cancer because, for example, prostate cancer barely exists in its uh, form as a cell line. So in parallel to that, we've been um, trying to establish primary tumor models. I know a lot of people are now doing this. Uh, we've been doing this since 2007. We've implanted around 2,200 tumors um, and now have 410 established primary tumors that can be uh, propagated, uh, frozen down as fragments, rethought, and used as um, model systems. So um, we're in the middle of categorizing these. Uh, since we started in 2007, first we were on arrays, now we're doing RNA-seq, then it's whole exome. So it's sort of a mishmash right now, but we expect by the end of this year to um, to finish profiling this, and, and we're doing ongoing collections to try to fill in the gaps that uh, now exist. So we hope that this will become not as facile as a cell line encyclopedia, but still a second source of models that one can use to profile compounds and, and even mimic mini clinical trials prior to the human, uh, the human clinical trial. So I'm just going to close now by um, going through these five problems now as uh, more uh, statements of what we need to do. So first, complete the cancer genome in depth. Uh, work on validated but difficult to drug targets. Discover synthetic lethal drug targets, in particular in the tumor suppressor arena. Study resistance preclinically. Don't wait till we get to the clinic, but try to anticipate resistance and use that to drive either better therapeutic development or novel combinations. We need to discover those novel highly combina combinations and start testing them as early as possible in clinic de clinical development. And then finally, we're continuing to build um, a robust preclinical translational infrastructure to allow more of us to sort of explore these questions uh, at a level which will give us confidence and greater uh, direction as we go into the clinic. So I just want to thank um, the patients who have participated in our clinical trials. And I have the privilege of working, as many of you do, with a great group of scientists great collaborators uh, at the Broad and elsewhere, uh, and I want to thank them uh, for all their help. So thanks. So Bill, thanks for really an uh, inspirational presentation, uh, uh, really demonstrating some of the ways in which the uh, cancer genomic research that all of us are doing here can start to lead to benefits uh, uh, directly for patients. So we can have time for a few questions uh, for Bill to follow up. So uh, please go ahead. Enthusiasm completely on the synthetic lethal approach. And I want to um, share with you some success we've had with uh, one gene for a well siRNA screening approach. Uh, some of the successes we've had are a very high level of reproducibility of our hits, about 70 or 80 percent. Secondly, we get a much deeper menu of potential targets. Um, we get the whole iceberg instead of the tip of the iceberg because we can query every gene in the one gene per well approach. And third, uh, it's a new area we're very excited about, is doing screens on primary <clears throat> patient-derived tumor cultures with siRNA. And very sh we can do the assays over a period of a, a week or two. And these are a couple of hits we've gone on to validate in preclinical models. <clears throat> well, we won synthetic lethal with P53 and uh, mixed synthetic lethal in uh, neuroblastoma model. <clears throat> so I think 2A is, uh, we agree that's a very good area to focus on. Yeah, our, we've done, we actually have moved off of well by well screening um, to the pooled screens, uh, partly because uh, you have the issue of transfection. Um, 
and uh, some cells are available to do transfection, others are not, but the heterogeneity of transfection was, uh, at least at the scale, we wanted to do this somewhat difficult. Um, we've done well by well lentiviral transduction, which turned, was, as you can imagine, generating each lentivirus one at a time was uh, quite, the, um, quite the hurdle. So we, anyway, I, I think th there's no right answer, but uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear it's working. Um, greetings. It's a very, um, very fascinating talk. Um, just very naively, I have two comments, and I'm interested in your suggestions. One is that um, I'm interested to know when is TCG community is um, going to work on metastatic tumors, and so we can compare primary versus metastatic. That's one impediment. And the second thing is that when I worked on uh, discovering subtypes of subtypes in breast cancer, what I did is data integration of uh, different data types, copy number, mRNA expression, so on and so forth. So what I found is that the, there are many cell lines that are representative of individual genomic alterations, but uh, one of the impediments was that there were um, limitation of cell lines that show the correlation of events as we see in the TCGA tumors. So what kind of comments or suggestions do you have to overcome Well, those? so maybe I can take the second question first, because that's the easy one. Is a 1,000 cancer cell lines enough to represent human cancer? Not even close, right? Um, so yeah, the cancer cell line encyclopedia is a limited representation. It represents what it can represent. Uh, we're going to try this year uh, starting to convert our primary human tumors, the PDX models, into cell lines. Um, I would like to see a effort where people who generate cell lines, um, either through a publication point of view or a grant renewal point of view, are asked to deposit them into ATCC, because I think there are a lot of cell lines out there that are not available or not readily available. So um, I'm with you that the cell line representation is not great. Accessing the ones that are available, making them readily available would be one thing. Clearly, media growth conditions, different ways to grow cells, that's probably going to have to be important as well. With respect to your first question, like when is TCGA going to do metastasis, since I'm not on the TCGA, uh, I wouldn't know, but um, probably when they get the metastasis samples, I would guess, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so Bill, could you expand on your, you said sort of offhand you didn't like the isogenic cell idea, and we have very great abilities now to manipulate cells with exonucleases, and we know that we have very complicated heterogeneity genetically in cancer, and are we going to rely on the luck of whether you get a primary human xenograft to get a model for a particular type, or, or why can't we engineer it as the simple well, way? Certainly, if you have no choice, then I, would, I wouldn't stay away from that. Um, so a few comments. Isogenic cell lines, in my experience, the ones that are created from cancer are not isogenic, or not necessarily isogenic. So if you take an oncogene and try to create the wild-type version of the cell by knocking out the oncogene, that to me is no. sort of violating the very principle of the idea in the first place. And we've had specific examples where an isogenic pair uh, was uh, provided to us, and the wild-type of the mutant cell line had basically deleted BCL2 during the sure. isogenic process. The second is that um, the noise is difficult to overcome, and often what we've seen is you get hits that are differential because of the wild-type cell line, not the mutant cell line. And this happened in the setting of VHL deficiency as well as in uh, the P. Kinase kind of setting. So th that's been I was just been thinking more, I, if you build up from an immortal but not malignant clone and add things to it, then Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying don't do it. I happen to like the genetic heterogeneity when you have one consistent lesion and 400 other sure. things, because then if something's consistent, um, you've already controlled for other genetic uh, events. But um, yeah, anyway, it's certainly harder to do these large-scale panels. And as you said, if you don't have the, if there are no cell line models for the disease you want to study, then then uh, you know there's, you can't be a stickler on uh, principle for, from that point of view comments and a question. So the first comment is about the metastatic cases. We are actively um, collecting triplets, so this is a, a source of germline, preferably blood, with the primary tumor and then if the patient had a meta metastasis, even if the metastasis was um, exposed to treatment, we will run those as triplets in TCGA. Um, so if, if you have them, we, we will take them. We are actively doing those. We have also um, 
a, a couple dozen recurrences for GBM and ovarian, et cetera, so those data are in the public domain. Um, I did want to also just make a comment, since most folks in this audience probably do not know about the TCGA collaboration with Novartis and Broad on the CCLE project, those cell line um, exomes will be coming into the public domain through CG Hub at UCSC and David Hausler's group in the next couple of months, followed um, in early spring, probably by the end of May, with um, those same lines and, and um, RNA-seq. So those, th there was a decision that was made that those data will be made publicly accessible without um, you know, having to go through the DAC process, so you should find those in CG Hub in, in 2013. My question is more, um, of course, wrought with fear about your statement that we should have to do, you know, all tumor types, all subtypes, et cetera, and whether an endeavor like that would um, need to, in your opinion, be continued to be led by um, the, the federal government um, as the person who you know, is responsible for 10,000 sample procurement, um, a, uh, a bigger you, you, project scares I was me. thinking much larger than that, actually. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's why, that's why I'm scared. So I'm curious whether you think it would be possible for a community-driven effort where the data are generated, um, you know, in individual sites and then data are deposited centrally. Sure, I mean, I, I, it's for you guys to decide on the model. I just don't, I just want to provide the message that we have a ways to go. And I'm with Lou, the genetic experiment has been done. It's like having taken yeast. You know, pre the reason we don't do forward genetics in mammalian cells is we couldn't sequence the genome. We did forward genetics in yeast because you could just sequence the genome and find the mutations. The forward genetic experiment has been done. And can we deconvolute it? Can we get enough little yeast tumors uh, and find all the patterns that go together? I, I think it's very exciting. You know, it may, it may take uh, another uh, log drop in uh, sequencing costs, but every time I see Matthew talk, the, the chart looks like it's going down, but. Uh. <laughs> so we sometimes envision a future where, where cancer is almost chronic, treated as a chronic disease. We, we do the genomics, treat, cancer recurs, do the genomics again, treat again. What's your view on building the, the, yeah, the I'm not, therapeutic armamentarium to make that successful? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a huge, I mean, I'm, I'm willing to accept it. I don't want to start at that proposition. The reason I don't want to start there is um, if I were a cancer patient, I wouldn't want to have to live with my cancer and the fear of it recurring all the time, and the necessity to go back to the doctor and to take a treatment and to get another treatment. I don't think that's the greatest existence if we could actually get rid of the cancer. So why can't we get rid of the cancer? Well, I don't know the answer, but the past history says even diseases like testicular cancer, which people forget, looked worse than pancreas cancer. Patients died in weeks of testicular cancer, is cured today. Now that may, yeah, again, that could be an exception, or we may find other ways to engender that kind of curative response. Now why do I think it's sort of dangerous to go to the chronic therapy model? You are not going to cure patients with homeopathic doses of medications that cause no side effects. In fact, one of the downsides of Gleevec is, in fact, it is so well tolerated, people now think we can treat melanoma and lung cancer with drugs that have zero side effects. Cancers, you, you need to inhibit the targets in cancers very potently. To do that, you're going to have side effects. But we can manage the side effects. We can find schedules. We can ameliorate side effects with other mechanisms. That's how it works for testicular cancer. That's how it's worked in lymphoma for many years. Um, my fear is if we don't try to cure, we will stop at doses that are sub-therapeutic or sub-curative. Now, that being said, if we try all that and it doesn't work, I'm fine. You know, we're treating to a model where we keep patients alive as long as we can. I think we should do everything we can to do that. But um, yeah, I'd rather aspire for the, the bigger cure than to retreat and never have the chance to get there. I think there's a question over so, here. You know, as a clinician, I'll tell you one thing, that uh, today we genotype patients very, very routinely, and our patients get biopsies on a regular basis, particularly at the time of disease progression. I do think there is an opportunity here for industry to collaborate with people like us to actually do sequencing studies, not up front, but at the time of disease progression. You know, it used to be a, a difficult thing before to get repeat biopsies, but today we do this routinely. But I don't think the industry is there yet, at least in our experience, 
to support these studies, you know, doing sequencing studies at the time of disease progression. Yes, yeah, you know. so, so support is a, you know, can be a word for pay for, but um, uh, no, I, can, I can tell you our, that we're very interested in this area. Of course, the first application is if we have our own trials, patients relapse, we're actually doing sequencing on biopsies when we get them. Um, I'm uh, in the process of setting up what we call a next-gen diagnostics group at Novartis that, in fact, wants to collaborate off of Novartis trials and on Novartis trials to answer questions just like the one sure. you proposed. Uh, there we imagine we're building the facility and the informatics that a clinician who had interesting samples might uh, want them analyzed, we'd be willing to do it. So we are uh, interested. I think, you know, Merck has had a pretty big investment in an in infrastructure in, in um, in uh, Florida around uh, sort of clinical samples. I don't know if it's focused on a resistance or not. But I think, I think people are, are pretty excited about that. So I just want to say we'll take the last two questions from Dr. Medico and Dr. Getz, and then uh, I, there probably are more questions yet to come, but we'll hold off on, on those for the people who are not yet up at the microphones. Um, okay, there's an intriguing problem about acquired resistance and the mutations that drive acquired resistance. Do they pre-exist in a small fraction of the cells, or do they emerge de novo? And if so, how, how can they come so efficiently during treatment? What's your opinion now on this? Uh, uh, I don't know. Um, I think it's a, it's a great uh, question, and I was talking uh, uh, earlier about, um, or asking earlier about, what is our actual sensitivity with NGS right now? Um, and uh, I think NGS is still not actually sensitive enough to answer the question. That is, if it's when, it, what, when in 10,000 uh, alleles you can determine, that's probably not, that's prob if you have a mutation at one in 10,000, that's a very common population of cells in the human body. So um, that's one issue is the technical limitation of NGS is still a problem. The second is at some point, it becomes a stochastic problem of biopsying, right? So a human has like 10 to the ninth cells somewhere in the body, you biopsy one place, as we've seen even in primary tumors, you don't know um, whether or not you've hit the biopsy point that would have the cell that might be uh, mutated or not. In either case, I still think the answer is the same. Um, I don't know the, how they generate them so efficiently, presumably mismatch repair and ongoing DNA repair issues, but the answer is the same, that is to create pressure on the cancer cell from more than one point where no one mutation, and hopefully no two mutations even, is sufficient to overcome the therapeutic pressure. So I think we can extrapolate from lymphoma where at least at, for one point it was four drugs, now I guess it's down to two, um, that you know, combinations at least work, in part, work at least in part by creating this pressure on the genetic evolution that the cancer cells, in fact, can't, cannot overcome. Gaddy. Be a great talk. Um, I want to ask, what's your take about heterogeneity in cancer, and what happens if you find a driver, druggable um, mutation that occurs in 20% of the cancer cells? Do you act or not act on that uh, event, and what do you think will happen to the cancer? If it were in 20% of one patient cells, yeah, I wouldn't work on that. I think for me, you know, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, the, the important message to me from the New England Journal heterogeneity paper was not the heterogeneity, it was the non-heterogeneous part. 30 mutations in that paper were completely conserved in every one of the tumor samples they sequenced. VHL was one of the founder mutations. We know that that's a driver in lung cancer. I want to know the earliest set of mutations that are persistently required for all the clones. That's my own uh, bias. Now, what was interesting in that paper was this idea of sort of mutually, uh, functionally redundant mutations. I think it was what, set to be, set B something and set B2 and KDM5 something or other. Okay, so that's sort of an interesting clue that maybe, in fact, during the evolution to the metastatic process, that pathway was, in fact, already turned on. So I would certainly want to look at that in the earlier stages and see if that pathway was already activated and whether this the heterogeneity showing a pathway would be then relevant to the earlier stage of the tumor. 